Hello, everyone. We are Irenacast. I'm Jeff. Hey, it's Rajiv. Thanks for joining us for a continuing <laughs> conversation to provoke your progressive Christian imagination. Hopefully, all of you are well. This week, Bonnie, Alan, and Casey are all on assignment, and you are you're stuck with Rajiv and myself for this continuing the conversation on our episode 171, which is uh, progressive or white supremacy in progressive Christianity. Right. So uh, this was a great episode yeah. that we did. But before we kind of get into the continuing the conversation, we have some uh, business to take care of, I guess. Uh, so the first and foremost, this will be the last continuing the conversation that will go on to the podcast feed. So if you're listening right now on the podcast feed, these videos after this one will sit on our Facebook page or our YouTube live page. Um, we just found that it was a little bit cumbersome trying to get this audio out on a regular basis. And we feel like the way that we're conducting these conversations is really more fitting for the medium that we're on right now. So they'll yeah. always be available. They just won't be available for um, podcast consumption unless, you know, you know how to just rip audio from a video on YouTube or anything like that, which, you know, feel free to do that as well. But in terms of the podcast feed, the audio after this one will no longer be on the podcast feed. So if you want to catch the continuing the conversations, check out our Facebook page and YouTube page. <clears throat> Excuse me. So yes, with that out of the way, um, I'm, I'm lost. Uh, <laughs> we, we had a listener send in something, right? Yes. Yes. That so we wanted to kind of open with kind of get in the conversation um, and, and really make it. We did get a, an email from a listener uh, and she had been listening to the series on white supremacy that we're doing. Like it's a mini series, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, she actually linked to an article, which I will put in the show notes of this episode when it goes live, which will be uh, iranicast.com slash 171 live. Um, but one thing she brought up in terms of progressive Christianity is one interesting point. She says I encountered uh, recently related to multicultural slash multiracial churches is that when the number of white folks falls to 50 percent, white people will leave. Also, that white people are overwhelmingly reluctant to be a part of a church with a non-white pastor slash leader. Therefore, any real multicultural congregations represent people of color going to white led churches. Which is very interesting. Um, and I think that we're, we, we do see that in more mainline, yeah. aggressive contexts. Yeah, it's, and it's, it's true. It's, it's sad, but it's true. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's, you know, there are some churches who have deliberately worked at being you know, integrated, multiracial, multicultural. Um, and have done a, a reasonably good job of it. And more often than not, uh, pastoral leadership is reflective of multicultural, multiculturalism and multi, multiracial as well. I, I think representation goes a long way with folks. Um, and yeah, but those, those congregations are few and far between. It was it was brought to our attention with a, a link to an article, which again we will put in the show notes. I think it's an NPR uh, article. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think we definitely, you know, we definitely see that. And then, in a lot of ways, I think. Well, I personally think I think representation is very important. But then I also think that it can be um, an avenue to tokenize. Sure. Very quickly. <laughs> There's. There's definitely a danger there. Yes. And it and it seems to be more, you know, on the progressive or, or mainline side that, that tends to uh, not, un, well, ignorantly, I don't want to say unknowingly because that sounds innocent, but ignorantly uh, <laughs> delves into tokenism in, in ways that are, you know, uncomfortable. Yeah. And it's, I mean, there's a, there's a, a church that we visited, we heard a lot about it. And when Bonnie and I had a Sunday off, we were like, well, let's go check out this church. It sounds like they're doing some really cool stuff. And, um, and they had a little band. Uh, they, I, I don't know the, the season that they were in, they chose a style of 
of, of song that was a little odd to me, but they were, I mean, they were good musicians. But anyway, the, the lead singer was an African-American guy with kind of, you know, dreadlocks and um, might have been the only black person. I think he and I might have been the only brown people in the congregation. And, and then one of the pastors in some sort of like kind of an interchange between one part of the service and another, she starts talking about how grateful she is for the band and et cetera. And then she goes into, you know, want to do a special thanks to insert that guy's name here and for, for being with us. Cause initially we hired somebody who kind of looked the part and they were, you know, blonde haired, blue eyed and blah, blah, blah. And they just didn't work out. And so we're grateful we have you now because you're a better. And I was just like, where, where is this going? What is this supposed to be accomplishing? Interesting. Um, and it just felt really strange. And I, I can't imagine what he was feeling like the, the singer through, through that whole thing. But this is a church that's been well regarded in the whole region as a very progressive minded, racially oriented church. And I didn't experience that at all. I think there were lots of good intentions, but I didn't experience practice of those intentions in, you know, in any real sense. Right. Right. Oh, Rachel, thank you for chiming into the conversation. She says, I was really lucky to find a UCC in Oakland led by co-pastor team. Uh, one was white, one was black, and now solo black pastor. It was a pretty amazing mm-hmm. congregation, Plymouth, Oakland. I learned a lot there. Uh, so it's good to see that yeah. there's leadership that's being representative for sure. And I think I know I know those people pretty well at Plymouth. It is a phenomenal congregation. And and both the current pastor and, and the pastor that was there for a while really great people. So if you're ever in the Bay area on a Sunday morning, that's a good place to go. I think their nickname is the jazz and justice church. Oh, nice. So some really great musicians. I mean, Oakland's got great music, Ben. So we're some of those folks show up Sunday morning. So here's a, 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 a little plug. Rajiv knows it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) All right. So we got, we got a plug. We got an endorsement. I don't know if absolutely endorsement is too much of a, anyway. Yes. Well, maybe not a show endorsement, but a personal endorsement. Right. There we go. (laughs) Uh, You know, Rajiv, kind of going back to what what you were saying a little bit. um, It's 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 interesting how I don't know if this is just developed as you kind of do the work of anti-racism, but you do you get into these spaces where you almost have like a sixth sense where you're like something doesn't feel right here. Like all the things are in place, but. I don't know if it's like mannerisms or certain phrases, but they're like, they kind of perk, perk you up. And you're like, wait a minute. Like, I get what you're trying to do, but you're not really doing it. And it's, mm-hmm. it's, uh, it's weird being in those environments. Cause it's hard to know what specifically to call out. You know what I mean? Right. And you know, what's, what's, it, it drives me crazy. Cause this is like every woman that I know that I'm friends with, that I've talked to things about race with, et cetera. Um, they understand the same kinds of dynamics as women. And, you know, it, it doesn't matter what context you're in, wherever you go, if you're, if you've been marginalized, you have the, what, what uh, I sometimes refer to as the uh-oh alarm. You just get that. Yeah. It's a look, it's a word, it's the lack of recognition. Um, like it's been a long time since I've been in a service where all the language around deity or God is male and masculine. Like I'm used to where it's inclusive language. Um, oftentimes, you know, it's, it's non-genderized. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so when I go to spaces where that's there, it's just like, Oh my God, I get physically like really sick. Kind of, I mean, I don't always actually throw up, but I feel like I'm about to. Um, yeah, but some of them are subtle and it's, if you grow grown up in a certain environment and that's just the way it's always been, it may be harder to notice. Um, and so visiting different places that are clearly different than what you're used to can be helpful to right. parse some of that out. Yeah. It helps being in different contexts and, you know, getting a feel for where, where you as a person 
have how you've changed, you know, mm-hmm. in terms of the language that that catches your ear. Um, you know, I was in, in recently in a context where a, a lot of those red flags were like blaring in terms of uh, LGBTQ community, gender right. rules, all that kind of stuff. Where you, the outside is everything it's supposed to be, but you can tell by the verbiage that it's just not. There's not a full understanding of what's happening there. Right. And the, you know, and then there's, there's, we touched on this a little bit in the episode and then there's groups that are trying really hard. Mm -hmm. Like they're really trying hard because they know it's the right thing to do and they're just not very good at it. Right. And my heart really goes out to, to groups like that where, I mean, the reasons are, are there, the efforts there, um, you know, there's, there's unity around the cause and they're just, you know, struggle. And I, I really feel, really feel for them. Yeah. Well, for those of you that are uh, joining the conversation, please feel free to chime in in the comments, uh, mm-hmm. whether it's something specific about the episode itself or uh, perhaps just sharing your experience with uh, white supremacy in uh, supposedly progressive circles. We're very interested to hear more stories about that. Um and then also don't forget, I don't know if you've listened to the episode or not, but there we did have a, uh, I think it's my new favorite segment of the show where we all pick three songs related around a particular theme. And so we came up with a protest playlist. Uh, so oh, yeah, it's good. We'll have the link in the show notes for this. And then if you have listened to the episode, it's in the link there. We, we, we set it up on Spotify. Uh, so, you know, also if you want to chime in in the comments, let us know your favorite protest songs and. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. we can do a like an honorable mentions playlist, a, a playlist to follow. I don't know. We can figure it out. Um, but yeah, feel free to to jump in on the comments as we kind of continue this conversation. Yeah. Well, uh, so, something I didn't share in the episode that I was thinking about sharing, but you know, throw it out there now since it's just the two of us, Jeff. Um, <laughs> you know, I while I was going through the ordination process, I was um executive director of an interfaith program that, that ran a homeless shelter for families. And you know, we had 30 some um, churches that were oh, congregations that were part of it because it was interfaith. And um, we did these annual programs where we got like the choirs together to do things. One of the board members ran, ran this. And it was a really cool event. And I was newly ordained. And I was part-time pastoring a small church and still doing this job. And we, the host church, it was a church this year. Uh, and their associate pastor was a, a white woman. And she was sitting next to me and she was like, oh, I see Reverend by your name. She's like, um, so are you like really ordained for real? Or is it just one of those churches that ordains whoever? And I was like. Oh, dang. I mean, I, I didn't even know what to do. I was like, it was just the, the strangest feeling. And this is a, she's part of a mainline denomination, her church, you know, they, they claim to be, they don't claim to be progressive, but you know, they're, they're definitely not a conservative church and they're involved with homeless families. You know, we, they were part of our, our organization. So it was just a, just a, and this is the Bay Area. This is the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, so it's it's like <laughs> it's everywhere. It's Man. everywhere. There's no way around it. Right. It, who asked? Like I just I still cannot to this day wrap my head around like like what what is the hoped response from something like that? You know, like what? I mean, we're sitting there on the front row. You know, there's a few participants in the service. You know, there's it's a packed house. All the choirs are getting ready. Um, and she leans over and asks me this. And, you know, I, I have not a keynote address because it's a choir. It's a multi-congregation choir program. So I have a small address in the middle of it to rep the organization and obviously ask for money and stuff. Um, so it just, and it was hard to get past that and like, kind of get my shit together and do my thing a little later. Jeez. Oh, but it's like, man. Yes. Ugh. <laughs> That's a good response. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, 
uh, Richard in the comments says, beware of the all are welcome sign. Yes. If you're not specific, you're not inclusive. Uh, I don't know how many. I remember uh, Richard uh, is a good friend of mine. I mean, essentially family. And we worked together at a church that was um, within the United Methodist that was trying to be reconciling for the LGBTQ community. Mm. And everyone who was, you know, left leaning, I guess, who were accepting and all that kind of stuff. They're like, well, why can't we just say all are welcome? Right. Uh, and it was the one time my evangelical background came into handy. And I remember saying in a meeting, look, all churches say all are welcome. Yeah. That, that in fact, that's almost a negative thing to say. Yeah. Uh, it's, you know, it's the, <laughs> it's the all lives matter equivalent of church slogans. Um, yeah. And, all are welcome as long as you're like us. Right. And as long as you conform, uh, the doors open, but. Well, I think like you too, I can't remember which song it is. But uh, it's it, they have this line. It says, "You ask me to enter, then you make me crawl." It's like that's yeah. that's really what the banner should be saying. Yeah. We want you to enter, but get on your knees and grovel. Yeah. It's a good song. One, you two. One. That's yep. it. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Uh, speaking of music, uh, good transition there, Adam. Yeah. Uh, former guest of the show and my fellow yeah. host on Divine Cinema. Uh, his protest song right now is "The Decemberists." Everything is off. <laughs> Uh, I don't think I've heard that one. I've heard of no, check it out. I don't yeah. think I've heard listen to them. I think maybe it always sounded a little bit too uh, hipster for me. I, I, I was just about to say something about hipster and <laughs> like, no, I'll let that go. It's okay though. Adam's a good guy. December is no, Adam's a great guy. Trust his opinion. Actually. Yeah. yeah we, we all met. Adam was with us when we first met at the, the round table. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Options round table. Very cool guy. Uh, Richard says, uh, amen, Rajiv, or so we can change you. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. In, in, uh, in reference to what we were just talking about. R- of- Richard, what's your dog's name? He'll put it in the comments. He'll, he'll put it in the comments. Cause we see that dog popping up. It's cute. Uh, speaking about the, the December is everything off. It was written in <laughs> 2016 nerd. <laughs> Adam, is that something you just know off the top of your head, man? <laughs> yeah, no. it's hard. Or did to you have to look it up? What people really know when you're talking to them <laughs> <via> chat because <laughs> they could be looking it up right now. Splitting screens, looking smart. He probably knows though. That's my guess. Nushi, Nushi, that's cute. Dog. I don't, I, Richard. I still can't tell if she likes me or not because she barks every time I'm over there. I think she just loves her people what's your track record with dogs jeff i love dogs they're my favorite yeah. in the world yeah um, most of the time i think she she's nice she's nice always nice when i gets there when i like sit down she's oh, okay cuddly she's so, just a little more she has her favorite she's very vigilant funny. yeah she's very i think my impression and Richard, you can, I mean, this is a little sidetrack, Richard, <laughs> like, me if I'm wrong, but uh, <laughs> she she loves her masters and uh, is jealous for their attention yeah. in every yeah. way, shape, and form, which is understandable. It's totally understandable. But yeah, I love I loved dogs. I miss having a dog. I'll have We're one. so starved for like normal pub style conversation. We're like, hey, what's your dog's name? I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> Quarantine's getting to us. Um. Yeah, I mean, this 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 subject's obviously super big, and you know, we didn't, uh, we don't just like with all of our episodes, we're scratching the surface. We're we're trying to cultivate conversation in people and let people know like these are issues that are important. And when we talked about, you know, talking about white supremacy, you know, we all came from evangelical backgrounds or you know varying evangelical backgrounds mm-hmm. that seemed, you know, pretty easy to call out those things. And then we, you know, we also have to realize that even in, in all, all white circles, it's going to exist. Yeah. Left or right. It's going to be there if it's a dominant white circle and it takes work and education to develop a sense of, wait a minute, we need to look at this outside of the bubble that we're in. Yeah. I mean, cause we're, we're, uh, you know, talking about white supremacy and race and this is, you know, re- recapping our last one in a three-part series. And I was reading today that um, the Orange president is not going to visit and pay honor to John Lewis while he's laying in state. And I, I don't understand 
I don't understand one how a U.S. president could do that, and two, I don't understand why there isn't an avalanche of backlash and berating from people in his own party. Um, because I mean that's I, I it's just unfathomable, right? Especially like with everything, the context of everything that's happened since George Floyd, but even even without that. Um, the, the place that this man has in the history of our country, in the, mm-hmm. history of the civil rights movement, in the history of everything that has happened, uh, to people of color, uh, particularly the black community and to not be there in any way, shape or form, you know, because he was critical of you. I mean, who wasn't he critical of? That was his that was his job. That's why he right. being uh, you know, that's why he's being laid laid to state. Like that's every time you think you're not gonna be surprised. Right. It, it's yeah, unbelievable. Unbelievable. <clears throat> um uh, Kelly Anderson in, in uh um holiday and regarded this as impossible that he was told not to buy the family. Um, yeah, I could see that as a fu- at a funeral. Like, you're not welcome at the funeral. But this is the nation's capital. Right. This is a um, So I, I don't think the family, I think, I think Congress would be deciding right. something like that. So, yeah, Pence I'm not... There, and Mitch McConnell yeah. spoke. Yeah. Yeah. So, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I don't think he's going to be welcome at any funeral. Right. 100%. 100%. Uh, Lauren, this is a a great question. This may be off topic, uh, but I've seen conservative Christians associating BLM movement to Marxist theology. And I'm wondering when being a Christian became aligned with being a capitalist. (laughs) You, You got me, man. I don't know, Lauren. I'm as baffled as you are. From my from my reading of history, it was primarily through the, the Christian coalition. And it was it, the, the, the major movement in that direction was um, the, the Reagan administration. Uh, and that it kind of started with a lot of the dog whistles and stuff in the, the camping mm-hmm. tactics of Nixon that led mm-hmm. to that particular era of that. Um, and that's where you kind of had that solidified in a lot of ways. Uh, and also, yeah. in other ways, the rise of the megachurch. So capitalism and church culture became one and the same. Televangelists, all that stuff corresponded a lot with the, the Reagan administration and some of the policies and the ways that he connected with the religious right. Yeah, absolutely. Two, two plugs. One is if you have Hulu, watch Mrs. America because it touches on a lot of this stuff. It's a really great series. And it's it's a limited series, but it, it's super well done. and. Um, Two, this is just like a shameless self-promotion. The new posta- podcast that Bonnie and I started, Haystacks, we interviewed Catherine Stewart, the author of Power Worshippers, and she does a deep dive. The book is phenomenal. And we're going to release that episode in October because uh, we do that one monthly. And um, it's a great interview. Talks a lot about the mega churches and them basically being a political arm of conservative politics in this country and um yeah so that'll that'll be october right okay and a general misunderstanding all the way back to the red scare of marxism and communism um where we're really afraid of fascists and dictators it's not you know (laughs) any form of government whether it's a democracy or marxism or whatever if it's if it turns into fascism with a bad leader it doesn't matter. It's not going to work. People are going to be oppressed. Uh, so right. it's also a fundamental misunderstanding of what Marxism is and the um, the scare tactics and the fear tactics that have been involved with anything correlated with communism or uh, any kind of redistribution or sharing of wealth. Right. Uh, and from the government, because, the you know, the, the, from my conversations with many in in the evangelical church when it comes to the distribution of wealth and charity and all that kind of stuff. Well, that's the church's job. That's the church's job. But the church, even all the churches combined don't have enough resources to be able to take care of a country like ours. Like it has to be Mm -hmm. 
I mean, this isn't a political conversation, but I think that those are some of the, the key points and where that that marriage of capitalism and, and right wing Christianity has evolved. You say? Anytime you're talking about Jesus, it's a political conversation. True. I mean, really. And that, like back to Lauren's question, you know, the, the conservative Christians talk about, well, Jesus is my best friend, my personal Lord and Savior. Well, it's like, well, get to know your personal Lord and Savior. Get to know your best friend. I mean, it's it's not hard to find evidence to support that he was. He certainly wasn't pro-capitalist. He was like, you know, that's whatever. But all of his stuff was right. far more socialist than capitalist. And and staying with our our theme of uh, white supremacy within progressive Christianity, uh, there's a hip, hypocrisy when it comes to that. Is that we have a lot of mainline denominations who will decry capitalism, but whose institutions are benefiting from the worst parts of capitalism, um, mm-hmm. and that continue to benefit with the the money that that was accrued through slavery and on through you know everything. Uh, so there's there's blame to go around. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm probably on our on our show. I'm the one that's the most pragmatic about capitalism <laughs> out of everybody, probably. which is weird because I, I personally I think capitalism doesn't have an embedded moral compass. I think it's a vehicle to do things um, and we have thrust on it a, a, a morality that is you know void of ethics and we've we've rewarded greed rather than rewarding um, service and and innovation for the greater good rather than innovation and market share for for personal individual enrichment so I think it's a vehicle a structure that can do a lot of good it's just been largely used to to do some some harm and good for a very select few well that's getting worse I mean I think there was a time when it was a little better. I mean, I I don't want to return to the days where there's lords and ladies who own everything, and I get to live in a little shack and sweep out the horse dung for all of my days, and my kids are destined to that work too. I like being like, oh, this is actually my little piece, and um, you know, I have stuff to share and welcome others, etc. I right. I don't know if it's the end all be all, but yeah, <laughs> out of the five of us, I tend to be the most like, and eh, wait a second. Right. That's probably true. I don't think we've really had like a full fledged conversation yet on that would be fun. Capitalism and Christianity and all that yeah. kind of stuff and how that fits in. That would be an interesting conversation. Well, I certainly don't think they're synonymous. Ooh, oh, yeah. hundred you know, percent. Absolutely not. Right. <clears throat> but at least within our context, it's certainly weird how certain wings of religions have attached themselves to certain wings of politics. Yeah. Or political ideology and how those things fit mm-hmm. together, which, yeah, anyway. Um, mm-hmm. So, white supremacy, it's everywhere. Bunch of jerks. Yeah, there's, there's, there's no way, there's no, you can't run, you can't hide. It's true. It's true, unfortunately. It is everywhere. It absolutely is. Um, so, you know, let us know uh, more of your thoughts. Thank you for everyone that so far that's uh, contributed to the conversation. We've had some great uh, questions so far. Uh, oh, here we go. Look at that. I just, I talk, I say, and therefore it becomes. <laughs> uh, Adam, uh, curious what you all think about how the uh, parentheses hopeful breaking of white supremacy will happen in church institutions. Will the progressive church survive or does it need to be to to break as well? That's a good question. That is a good question. Roger. Right. Yeah. Let, let me jump in there. Okay. Uh, progressive Christianity is not a church. It's, you know, it's bigger. Christianity is bigger than any institution. Um, and I think conflating the two has been a problematic uh, dynamic in culture and systemically, we sort of think the church and we actually mean Christianity or we say Christianity and we actually mean the church. So I would separate the two. Um, I would say, by and large, it's clear that the way we have done church, like the organizational structure, the 
the way we, you know, the Sunday morning meetings, et cetera, that's clearly on the decline. It's not meeting the needs of people well enough that they're willing to go out of their way to make it. So that's, that's certainly on its way out. I think some things need to change. We are seeing some growth and development and interest in more open-minded, open-hearted forms of Christianity, uh, whether that attraction can be well facilitated by existing structures is a question that we need to to look at um, or answer somehow. So I, I'm not worried necessarily about Christianity as a whole, as a faith tradition or progressive Christianity as a, a spiritual path. Um, but the institutions of church definitely have some work to do to be responsive to to the changing changing needs of people hmm. um, and the changing needs of how we do community. And you know, this pandemic has forced forced us into trying some different things. Right. Yeah, I think uh, the pandemic, when looked at in the history books, is going to um, bring some results to the, the church institutions that uh, are going to be lasting for centuries. I think this is a really pivotal way in people and how they interact with their, their faith communities and their mm-hmm. religion and everything. Um, yep. And not just in Christianity, obviously, but all across. And it, it, just going back to that question too. Um, and, and this is for me. Uh, I feel like for me, indulging hopelessness is in, is uh is indulging my privilege as a straight white male um mm. because it brings me to a place where i feel like i can easily wash my hands of something because nothing is going to become of it and i i honestly i do have to fight that a lot because there are people that are fighting and doing the good work um who hopeless or not it needs to get done and i feel like um, for me to to indulge a, a train of thought or a feeling long enough to where I give up, then I feel like there's privilege in that where my life isn't affected. Maybe my um, maybe my internal life a little bit, but uh, I, I can walk away from something like that, and I shouldn't be able to. I shouldn't be able to. Yeah, solidarity, man, solidarity. Right, right, one hundred percent. That's it's the only way forward. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kelly says, any thoughts on, on Tom Cotton? <laughs> Dang it. Ke- Kelly knows me pretty well and I know her pretty well. So she's like, she's just throwing red meat out. Um, God, I try really hard not to hate people like really hard. And, and most times I'm, I'm pretty good at it, but this guy, it's harder for, for me not to hate this guy than not to hate Donald Trump. Cause I, Donald Trump is just, he's just a mess. He's just a mess. I don't know. I don't know if he's ever understood what it means to be loved. Um, And I I think that's a big part of his problem. Uh, Tom Cotton, man, he's a special kind of, he's a special kind of, I wouldn't call him evil because I think there's always potential in everybody. But the stuff he spews is a special kind of evil. Like even when you look at it historically, he's he's like he's right in there with some of the great evil ideologies in our history. He's certainly a product um, of, of the the most evil that our system is able to put out. Well, I and mean, he's just like willfully and gleefully giving into that. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, he's just gobbling up the darkness. Right. And then, and, and I think when all is said and done, like going back to what you said about Trump, like the, the real villains here are the ones that are enabling this guy. There's no way that anyone can like look and be like, okay, he knows what he's doing. He's savvy. He's you know any any of that. Like th- this is a complete enabling by the party and and a power grab while they they can. And knowing, I think this is just speculation. Knowing that. It's, it's like a scapegoat situation. They can do whatever they want. And uh, when all is said and done, they can just put it on Trump and think they can move forward. And I hope that people are smarter than that. Um, yeah, I do too. And I, I mean, you know, here I am again, sort of taking 
uh, another, not another sign, but, you know, I, I, I genuinely feel bad for folks who are kind of traditional Republicans right? who have seen their party be taken over by stuff that, I mean, it's really anti-American at, at its core. It's completely antithetical to the American experiment and American ideals. Um, and we need, we need liberal thought. We need conservative thought in, in heated but respectful conversation in order to move forward. Mm -hmm. I think it's that tension and people across the aisle being friends historically that made us a pretty, pretty successful country for the most part Mm -hmm. um, around issues like standard of living, you know, race, gender, those are problems. There's no question. But having come from as an immigrant from India, um, I, I wouldn't be excited about going back to India to live there permanently because the standard of living is tough. I mean, unless you're really, really wealthy, um, you know, day to day life is is kind of rough. Um, so anyway, that. Yeah, I, I, it's it's such a hot mess. And and I'm grateful for things like like the Lincoln Project, which is a group of Republicans trying to take down Trump. So they can take back their party, and they're right. they're fierce, man. <laughs> their their ad campaigns, their media stuff is pretty good. Yeah, it is. I mean, they're really they're really going after it. It's nice to see in a way. Uh, Nancy says here in Arkansas, the word evil is sure thrown around, thrown into the conversation when it comes to uh, Tom Cotton. Um, so for for some of our, our listeners that might not be familiar, uh, Rugby, he who shall not be named. Yeah. What 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 why why is it that that Tom Cotton brings you such uh, borderline hatred? Or I, I can't, I cannot even go down that road. Okay. Just, just do a quick Google search. It's right. It's awful. Well, okay, I'll, I, I can't help it because this is fresh in the news. But he did some interview, and he's talking about how slavery was a necessary thing. Yeah, a necessary evil. Necessary evil. Well, at least he called it evil. Which I don't think he even fully believes. Yeah. I think you'd go back to it if you had the chance, honestly. That's a horrible thing to think and feel about somebody who's representing a lot of folks. But the, but even that, that term, like necessary evil, like... <laughs> inexcusable evil, maybe, yeah. Right, right. Or, I mean, because really, if you break it down, I mean, it's it's... it's it's a uh, it's a dismissal. It's not an acknowledgement. Acknowledgement was this like and he's saying I would I would assume that he's coming from necessary evil in the sense that, hey, we have what we have because of it. It was necessary to get here. We got here as opposed to, hey, we are where we are because of this evil that we did and we need to make it right. It's it's the difference between acceptance and repentance. It's the difference between, um, uh, you know, in I don't know. I guess acceptance and repentance is the best I can come up with. <laughs> quick, quick political shout out, man. I'm full of shout outs and endorsements. Today. <laughs> but Nancy White, you're in Arkansas. Look up Celeste Williams. She's running for, for the house. Um, and she's a nurse. Her husband is a good friend of mine from high school. Um, he moved from Maryland because in his words, he, he fell in love with an Arkansas girl. So um, check her out. Celeste Williams. Uh, her campaign's great. I follow her on socials. Good stuff. And if you happen to be in her district, um, help out, I guess. I go look at that. Political advice, history yeah, lessons. We're just, hitting all the major points like, today. Dear. Yeah. <laughs> People are tuning in and they're getting told what to do. That's right. That's what, that's <laughs> what we do. <laughs> no, it's not what we do. It's just... Um, yeah. So, uh, any other thoughts? I mean, I think we're, uh, Oh, there we go. Nancy says we'll do. So awesome. Go and check that out. Very awesome. Cool. Thanks, Nancy. Yeah. And uh, I hope we're saying your name, right? Right. Yeah. Whenever there's a different spelling, we always want to be yeah. uh, mindful that yes. I, I have a particular sensitivity to that. <laughs> Are you saying your name right? I do too, but not. I, I I acknowledge and recognize that it's not even close to the same level that I'm sure that you've experienced. Uh, but my last name uh, is Italian, and it's almost always butchered in some way, shape, or form. Uh, 
All right, what what are what's the most common butchering? Uh um uh Minaldi is a big one. That's like the uh, big, like, like they mix the A and the I all the time. That's the primary mispronunciation. Uh, but it was so bad at my high school graduation that they called my name and I was just sitting there because I didn't even <laughs> recognize it as my name. And they're like you know, the order thing, and they're like, That's you. I was like, That's me. They added an F in there. I don't know what. <laughs> So to be kind of nudged, there was like this awkward pause in the middle of my graduation. They put an F in your name? Yeah, I don't know what, like Man Philly or something. I don't know what. It was so bad. I have no idea. Man Philly. It was, it was so bad. Oh, man. And it's super phonetic. That's rough. I it is very phonetic. Right? Like it, it's. I'm telling you, do they still sell those hooked on phonics packets? I, I should. Some, <laughs> like Back literally some emails i'll like professional emails i'll put like the parentheses and i'll do the phonetic like man ill and then d-e-e just to, so that people can see like, right how you pronounce it um but yeah it's fine it's my little yeah. least worries right right uh, well rajiv any any last thoughts uh unless we get something in the comments about uh white supremacy and progressive christianity last thoughts is vote people Get yourself registered. Make sure your secretary of state and your respective state has your information correct. If you allow the mail-in ballot, get a mail-in ballot. Uh, one thing that I've done historically is I get the mail-in ballot so I can research stuff I'm not familiar with, vote. And then I'll take it in on on election day because I like the energy of people and drop it in the box and just sort of stand around and look. Um, but I'll probably mail in this year just because I don't want to get sick. And I don't think we're going to be past the pandemic by then. So register to vote. Make sure your information is correct with your um, secretary of state. And uh, and then vote. Vote like your life depends on it. Right. Yep. I'm 100% with you. I think that's the way to go. Uh, and then speaking of what you were talking about earlier. Uh, yeah, there it is. I a, a there URL. she is. Les William for Arkansas. Check that out. Yeah, she's cool. Yeah, so then uh, for this week's Continuing the Conversation, I'm Jeff. This is Rajiv. Thanks for joining the conversation. Peace. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. Bye.